Open in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews and chapter 11. You know, you may recognize chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. It's one of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. It's one of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. It's known as the faith chapter. Emunah Bevrit. Or in Hebrew, Emunah. It's faith. It talks about faith. You know, you can turn on the television today and you can see a lot of people talking about faith. And you can hear a lot of people saying what they think faith is and what they think faith is for. But the Bible is really very clear. It tells us exactly what faith is and it tells us exactly what it's for. It may surprise you to know that faith is not about making you rich. It's not about you getting that new apartment or that new house. It's not about you getting that new job. It's not about you getting that new Mercedes Benz. It's not about you. It's not about me. Faith is given to us to glorify our Heavenly Father. It's not given to us so that we can ask in faith and get everything that comes into our mind. That's not what it's about. And so if you've been watching somebody on television and they've been telling you that you can have whatever you want if you just pray in faith and that God wants you to be rich and He wants you to have all of these possessions, get rid of that television. Because that is not what the Bible says. In fact, God's example given in Yeshua HaMashiach was that He became poor and He lived among those who needed to hear about the Kingdom of Heaven. And He became poor so that through Him we might be made spiritually rich because of His poverty. He left His throne in Heaven came down and became a man and walked and lived among us that we might know eternal life, what we were created for. And it says a very important verse in the Bible. It says that by grace we are saved through faith. But it doesn't stop there, does it? It goes on and it continues and it says, it, even that is not of yourselves. It is not of works lest any man should boast. So faith is what saves you. You're saved by grace through faith and even that is not of yourselves. It's not of works is clearly what the Bible says lest anybody should boast. And yet today you have preachers boasting in their faith. And they tell you that you just need to work up your faith so that you can get what you want in life. You see, there's already two problems there, isn't it? Because you're using faith, which is supposed to glorify God, you're using it to try to get what you want. Why don't you forget about what you want why don't you start praying and asking God to give you what He wants in your life? And the things that will glorify Him, not the things that will make you wealthy and comfortable. That's biblical faith. And today as we begin studying the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, we've now made it through the first of the book of Hebrews and all the way up to this famous faith chapter. Today we're going to start finding out what faith, godly faith, true biblical faith is really all about. And throw away all the things that you've seen from television that are not biblical. And let's find out what God says about faith. And let's become a people of faith. And you're going to find out some interesting things as we study this chapter. Usually we go through one chapter a week. 
We try to. Sometimes we only make it through a few verses or, or through half of the chapter. But this chapter is so very important to us and it's going to take a while to go through. We will probably go through this chapter in a minimum of two weeks and probably three weeks because there is just so much there. So as you open up to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 is where we're going to begin reading and I'll, I'll ask uh, Don maybe if you could, could you bring me a chair up here so I can set this water here and so I won't have to keep juggling the, uh, the Bible and the microphone and the water. Thank you. Thanks bro. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, read with me now if you will. It says, now faith is the substance of things that are hoped for. It is the evidence of things that are not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, and God testifying of his gifts, and through it, though he is dead, he still speaks. He speaks to us this lesson of faith. And verse 5 continues and says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not even knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Yitzchak and Yaakov, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised, and therefore from one man and him, as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now we're going to stop there, having read up through verse 12, and we're going to talk a little bit about what these first 12 verses mean to us today as we talk about biblical faith. And remember, it may interest you that it's going to be completely different maybe than what you've heard faith is all about. Because it's not something where you just treat God like a vending machine and you put your coins in the machine and you push your selection and out comes your selection whatever you ordered at the exit there. That's not what faith is. Faith has been given to you for two reasons, at least. The first reason is so that you can know God. It says, by grace you have been saved through faith. Therefore, we can assume that you would not be saved by grace 
if you did not come to that grace through faith. Because the Bible says you are saved by grace through faith. So if there is no faith there, there is no way to get to the grace that saves you, you see. That's the first reason that you're given this faith. And the Bible teaches us that to every man is given a measure of faith. Everybody has received enough faith to believe in God. It just depends on what you do with that faith. The second reason that you're given faith is to sustain you in your walk of believing and walking with the Lord. Because you're going to need to walk by faith. The Bible says, in fact, that the just shall live by faith. That's how we're supposed to live. And you say, well, that's pretty risky, isn't it? That's pretty scary stuff because faith, you know, what is that? I, I just believe that something's going to happen and maybe it happens and maybe it doesn't. And you say, is that a way to live? I mean, I would die of stress the first few months of my walking with the Lord. Yeah, and you know, I have to tell you, having been over here for six years now in ministry, I have to tell you that perhaps the greatest miracle that I've seen, and I've seen a lot of miracles here in this land, but one of the greatest miracles that I've seen is the fact that I'm not dead because of all the stress that I've been going through because we never know. You never know if there's going to be enough money to pay the bills. You never know if there's going to be enough food to eat. You never know if you're going to be able to pay for your apartment. And you say, well, everybody goes through that. But wait, I can't work here. The way that I come into the land, I am not allowed to work here. I cannot make a single shekel by working in the land of Israel. And we have a rule here. We never ever ask for money. And you say, what are you, crazy? Perhaps. But we have a rule. We never talk about money. We never ask for money. We don't even make it part of our prayer list for our prayer needs so that people in Europe, people in America, people elsewhere around the world can read about it and they say, oh, they need some money. They need this much. I'll, I better write out a check. We never ask. We never tell people what we need. That's pretty scary. Because every month, on the last day of the month, we find out how much money is going to be put in the bank the next day on the first day of the coming month. And we never know. We didn't talk to anybody about money. We didn't talk to anybody about help. Send us some help here. We need help. We can't pay the bills. We feed hundreds of people in the soup kitchen. We treat hundreds of people in the medical clinic. We hand out hundreds and hundreds of blankets in the winter. And clothing. Not to mention the, the places that we have for people that had no place before we rented them. And all of this is done on faith. And I'm here to tell you that after six years, I can report to you that you can trust God and that He will care for you and He will take care of every need that you have. And He's been faithful to do this in this ministry for the last six years. And it says that in the book of Psalms that he looks throughout the earth to try to find people to whom he can show himself strong in their lives. It's not about your strength. It's not about how wise you think you are. It's not about how important we may think that we are. It's about God coming in to our lives and being faithful. This is the faith that the Bible talks about. And I would like to tell you that I've just been floating above the ground and keeping my eyes on the horizon and just looking to the Lord and not letting anything bother me. But that would be a lie. 
Because as I've gone through this ministry, I've had plenty of time to worry. And there's times when I was so afraid. And you know what? Personally, I think it's okay to be afraid. As long as you step out on faith. I think that it's okay. You know what those high diving boards are? Not the, not the small ones right here close to the swimming pool. You know, and you just jump off and you hold your nose and you try to make a splash. Not those, but the real high ones. That are maybe 10 meters in the air. 30 feet in the air. And you climb up there. And you crawl out there on all fours to get to the end of the board. And you try to get the courage to stand up. And as long as you stand up slowly, then the board doesn't shake, then you're okay. But when that board shakes you, like go down, you grab the board again with your hands, you know. I remember this in high school and in the Navy and we were supposed to jump off the board and then there is no going back. There is no retreat because there's a line of people up the ladder behind you. You have to go off the board. And you're standing there with all these other people in the Navy and they're looking at you to see if you're scared. And the spotlight is on you. And you stand up and you know you've got to jump because they're all expecting you to jump. What they didn't tell you was they're scared too. They don't want you to jump because then they're next. But I think it's okay to be afraid. As you're out on the end of that board, the board starts moving, you look down at the water below, you say your last prayers, and then you jump. At the point when your feet leave that diving board, you're living by faith. It's okay to be afraid as long as you put yourself in a position to where you have to trust God. Faith is not a New Testament concept alone, is it? Let's look and see what he says. He says here, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You hope everything's going to work out okay, but you just can't see how it's going to happen. And you don't know how it's going to work out. You only know one thing, and that is that God loves you, and He's promised to care for you. And you know that He likes faith. What it says in verse 2 again, it says, For by it, by faith, the elders, in other words, the people from the Tanakh, what you would say in English, the Old Testament, the people from the Torah, the people from the Nevi'im, the people from the Chetuvim, they all were people of faith. All of the heroes were people of faith. There's some that didn't have faith, and they were punished actually for not having faith. And those that didn't have faith were not allowed to enter the promised land. But God let them fall in the wilderness. And their children were allowed to enter because they had not rebelled against God. And God had made this statement about those who did not believe in. He said in Numbers chapter 11, He says, You were afraid that I was going to bring you out here to die in the wilderness. You were afraid and you didn't believe Joshua, Yehoshua, and Caleb when they came and told you that God would take care of you if you just went into the promised land. You didn't believe them because you were afraid that the giants there would kill you and that you would die in the wilderness. And so here's the deal. You're not going to enter my land. You're not going to enter the promised land. God told the people, I'm Israel. In Numbers chapter 11, he told them, it's not going to be you that I'm going to give the land to. It's going to be given to your children because you were afraid and did not enter. You see, they could have been afraid and chose to go ahead and enter the land. They could have been unsure and yet still walked ahead and put their lives in the hands of God. 
But they chose not to do that. They chose to be afraid and not do anything. They chose to play it safe. And they lost everything. Because even in the Tanakh, even in the Old Testament, as you would say in English, God required belief. You hear some people today, some of the people from some parts of Orthodox Judaism, not all of my Orthodox brothers are, are, maintain this, but some of them say, well, we do and you believe. Well, that's funny because in the Torah, God is very clear that we are also to believe. But the kind of faith that we are to believe with also has actions. And if you are a believer in Yeshua HaMashiach today, and you say, well, I have faith, so I don't need works, then you haven't read your Bible. Because the faith that the Bible talks about has works with it. You're not saved by those works. But you do those works because when God comes into your life because by grace you have been saved through faith and He enters into your life, He wants to do the things of God in your life. And if you think that you were saved to just sit around and watch television every day, I don't know what Bible you've been reading. Because the Bible says that there are things called fruit of the Spirit that God expects from your life. Love, joy, peace, charity, long-suffering, patience, kindness, forgiving people, bearing with people. All of these things are what we call fruits of the Spirit. And when God puts His seed in your heart, He expects it to grow up. And not just be a pretty tree, but to be a tree with fruit on it that glorifies Him, you see. You are saved to glorify God. And you are saved by grace through faith to bring glory unto His name. You're not given faith to buy that Mercedes. You're given faith to walk before your Heavenly Father in a way that brings glory to Him. To where if somebody says, well, how did you do that? How were you out there? How, how did you last all that time? You could say, it's because God is faithful. And you can bear witness to the goodness of Almighty God, your Father in Heaven. And that brings Him glory among the people that hear your testimony. And so, as it says in verse 2, that by faith the elders obtained a good report. They obtained a good report. Can you imagine, you know, some of the people of old, here's Abraham of Inu, Abraham our father, and God says to him, you know, I don't know how he said it, maybe he said it silently in his heart, maybe the big booming voice from heaven, you know, where God says to Abraham, Abraham, you know, and he says, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your nation. I want you to leave, in fact, everything that you know. And I want you to leave everything that you consider to be your security. And I want you to come to a place. And then God paused and he goes, as a matter of fact, I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. I'll show you later. That takes faith, doesn't it? Let's say that God spoke to you today. In your heart right now, he spoke to you and he says, John, I want you to leave everything that you know. Leave your father's home, leave your mother's home, leave your country. And I want you to go to some place to where you don't even know if you're going to be able to live. You don't know how you're going to live. You don't know how you're going to get food there. In fact, I'm not even going to tell you where we're going. Would you do it? That takes faith, doesn't it? That's why Abraham is called the father of our faith. Because the faith that we're called to is a faith that trusts God even though you may not always understand, you see. 
And because of that, he obtained a good report from God. Because he was a man who trusted God. He was a man who relied on God. Now, in English, unfortunately, when we say, I believe in God, sometimes, unfortunately, in English, you might use the term believe to mean something not as powerful. For example, if my friend Zvika was outside the door, and I saw him in the window, and someone would ask me, do you know where Zvika is? I would say, I believe he's out there. But what am I really saying? I'm saying, he might be there, I think he's there, but I really don't know. I think I saw him there earlier, but I don't know if he's still there. Maybe he left. So I say, I believe. So it's like, hetsi hetsi, half and half. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. But I'm saying the word believe. But in Hebrew, you would never, ever say that. In Hebrew, when you say you believe, you, you're saying you rely on that. You know that to be the absolute truth. That's what you're staking your life in. And you believe means I rely on God. I believe in God. I rely on on God. I believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, that He is the Mashiach that God sent to take away the sins of the world, and that in Him I have eternal life. I am not saying, well, I think I have eternal life in Yeshua. I'm saying, my life depends on it. I rely on Him. It is so important to me that is more important than my breath. It is more important than my heart beats. It is eternal life that now we're talking about. And so in Hebrew, when you say you believe, that's a big, big statement. By the way, that same shortish, the same root, is what we use for the word amin. So lehamin, that we would say, believe, I'm a believer, or I believe, or he mamina, I believe, she believes in Yeshua HaMashiach. We are saying that shorish, amen, so we're saying the same really as the word amen, which means that you're relying on it. So when you say Amen at the end of your prayers, if you're an English speaker, if you see the word Amen in the scripture, you can know that it's not just a way to end what's being said. It is an affirmation of faith that you believe in what you just said. And in fact, you're relying on it to be true. You're relying on the goodness and the faithfulness of God. We go on down to verse 3 again as we talk about these verses that we read. It says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. Simply saying in modern day English, if you can see it, it wasn't made by something you can also see. If you can see it, it's not made by the visible. And you say, well, no, I don't believe in that because I made a cake the other day. Well, let's talk about that. All you did was buy the chocolate. You bought the flour. You put two eggs in there. You stirred it around. You put some cake mix in there. And then you put it in the oven. Did you really create a cake? No. But you see, God creates things from nothing. Now, if you came to me and you told me, well, I created a cake the other day, and I said, really? You created something from nothing? You go, yeah. Yeah, I just said, yeah. let there be flour. Let there be two eggs. Let there be chocolate. And you put it all together in a pan. Well, wait, you said, let there be a pan. And then one of those big wooden spoons. And all of a sudden it was a cake. Then I would believe that you created a cake. But you see, you and I can't do that. Only God is Habore, the creator. And when it says that verse at the very first part of the book of Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim, 
Et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz. In the beginning, God created. Bore, bora, bara. In the beginning, God created, so he is ha or the creator, and he bara, he created everything, the heavens and the earth, from nothing. So we can see by the first verse in the book of Bereshit, the book of Genesis, Batorah, in the Torah, we can see that the things that exist were not created by things that you can see. Because God is the invisible God. He is spirit. He is the eternal spirit. He's not like you and I. He doesn't have flesh and blood like you and I have. Now the Bible talks about his hand and his arm. The Bible talks about his eyes, but actually it talks about seven eyes of God that go throughout the world. And You can't make God like you. And he is invisible, but he is all powerful. You know, I'll tell you a little thing that I've told you before. Before I came here, I was a senior staff engineer for a little high-tech company called IBM. And they don't have a lot of senior staff engineers. I was a solid-state physicist, and I worked in solid-state physics. As a hobby, I had astronomy and cosmology, astrophysics. And just to relax. You know, I, I had this huge telescope. You had to stand on a chair to look through the eyepiece. And I studied the makeup of stars and how the universe came into existence. Well, listen, without getting into a lot of detail, suffice it to say, here is where we are today in cosmology. Now, Ladies, I'm not talking about cosmetology, how you learn to put on makeup, but cosmology is a study of astrophysics, how the universe is put together. And I'm not talking about astrology because that's a false science. I'm talking about astronomy, the study of the universe. A true science. Here's what we know today. It has been proven since 1950 when a couple of Bell Lab scientists made a very sensitive listening device to listen for background radiation from an explosion that happened a long time ago, an explosion that we have come to call the Big Bang. And for many years it was a theory that people said the universe came from nothing. And somehow it all exploded into existence. You see, because before that, the people who did not want to believe in God did not want to believe in a creation. And so they had a thing called the steady state theory. And the steady state theory just said, the atheists would say, the steady state theory simply stated that everything just always was. And it never started and it will never end. It just was always there. And that's the steady state theory of creation. There's no creation. Well, then the problem is, is that scientists in about 1929, uh, the scientists, in fact, that created, gal or that uh, found that there were galaxies that exist, this scientist discovered that in fact these galaxies and other things in the universe are still expanding out away from each other. There's only one event that could describe that sort of a behavior. And that event would have had to have been an explosion. A big bang. And so the steady state theory mm, was no longer popular. But then the same atheist said, well, I know. It's not really expanding forever. It will really just expand to a point and then it will start to fall back in like you blow up a balloon and then the balloon, you let out the air and the balloon comes back down again. Then you blow up the balloon again. Then it comes back down again when you let out the air. And they said, it's an oscillating universe. Because it expands and then it contracts together again. And it has always been doing this. 
it is always expanded and it always contracts and who knows how many millions of times it's been doing it but it's never been created it was just there and it's expanding out and it's contracting again well the problem with that was was the scientists looked back at the data and they found out that no in fact things are expanding out so fast that there's not enough mass in the universe to create enough gravity to pull it all back together it will always expand and keep expanding which in essence means there was a beginning because it's irreversible it will never contract it will never fall back in on itself now you see now here's where we're going with this if there was a beginning then what did it begin from today people like Stephen Hawking the guy with multiple cirrhosis who's the heir apparent for Albert Einstein and others have done a lot of research and we now can take the Big Bang and theorize exactly what happened down into 10 millionths of a second 10 microseconds after the first initial explosion of the Big Bang we know what happens physics quantum mechanics classical physics and relativistic physics tell us exactly what would have happened but we don't dare go any farther because we don't know how we don't know what happened before that first 10 millionths of a second because if you keep going back to time zero then you have a question that nobody can answer you see physics the crown jewel of physics says that an object at rest tends to stay at rest until acted upon by an outside force this is Newtonian physics classic physics the other part of that rule says that an object in motion tends to stay in motion until acted upon by an outside force but let's deal with the first rule something that is there is going to stay there if it's still it's going to stay still until something comes along and acts on it to make it do something else since the Big Bang Theory postulates that everything came from an unimaginably small area smaller than what we call in physics a singularity or a black hole if you will since physics says that everything came from that then the question you are left with if you're a scientist and no astrophysicist on the planet can answer it the question that you come to is how to answer the statement of what you've just described which is first there was nothing and then it exploded how can nothing explode into something and yet the book of Hebrews tells us that you understand 2,000 years ago this, this was written and over 3,500 years ago in the book of Genesis we see the accounts that all of these things came into existence by the Word of God alone and today not a man or woman scientist on this planet can explain how nothing exploded into everything you see but as we read in verse 3 it says by faith alone we understand that the worlds were framed created by the Word of God so that the things which you and I see today all around us were not created by other physical things it can't happen it can't be and scientists will tell you that nothing physical can speak something else physical into existence from nothing and they can't explain the Big Bang and yet every scientist in the in the planet today is in agreement today that the Big Bang theory is no longer a theory that it is in fact fact 
and that it has been proven beyond any doubt, we now know that everything came into existence at that single point in time called the Big Bang. Which means that everything came into existence from nothing. And you thought that science and the Word of God doesn't agree. You see, it does. The evolutionists may think that they've taken God out of life. But the astrophysicist will say, well, we haven't gotten there yet. Because the way it looks from the Big Bang, everything came from nothing. And there's nothing in science that can explain that. And now the Bible tells us how that happens. And yet at the very first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We are called in the very first verse, aren't we? To a walk of faith in God. He didn't say how he did it. He didn't say why he did it. He didn't even say when he did it because time, space-time continuum didn't even exist at that time. So what was time? You see, it's all different with relativistic physics. So can God be true and science be true? Absolutely. Because there's multiple frames of reference. I, I won't even go into that. But when you study things like relativistic physics, uh, the general special theory of relativity, quantum electrodynamics, all of these things, you begin to understand that yes, in fact, it does agree with the Word of God. And there are many things that scientists can't explain, which the Bible has explained for thousands of years, and they fit science perfectly. So the astrophysicist would say to the evolutionary biologist, well, you may say that man just came from some ooze and mud on the ground, but I got news for you. The whole universe, it did come from God. There was no other way. There was no ooze that it came from. And so if you're thinking that the universe was created by the hand of God, then why is it such a stretch of the imagination to think that he created man in his image as well? And that you're not just an accident. You didn't just come from the goo through the zoo to you. You have a plan that God has for your life. You do have a purpose. And statistically, it is absurd to think of the statistical mathematics that would have to be abused to make you come here by chance. It goes well beyond 10 to the 100th power 10, which is considered in any theory of mathematics an absurdity. And yet that's the very theory that evolutionists rely on to say that you got here by accident. And you wonder why the world is coming apart. And you wonder why people go into schools and shoot up other people or people go into workplaces. And you used to hear about this maybe once every 30 years and now you hear about it once every couple of weeks. It seems like the whole world is crazy. Why is that? In America you took prayer out of school out of the school in 1963. You kick God out of society. Everywhere He is, you tell Him you're not welcomed here. And then you wonder why some kid goes into a school and kills people. Well, because he's saying, well, it doesn't really matter. There is no right and there's no wrong because that's what you teach me in school. There is no truth. There is no right. There is no wrong. There is no purpose for my life. On one hand, you tell me I just need more self-esteem. And on the other hand, you tell me I'm an accident of nature. A freak. That I came from the goo through the zoo to me. You're telling me to have self-esteem and that my life is meaningful. And yet you look me in the eye and say, you're just an accident of nature. There's no purpose for your life. The nation that forgets God, the Bible says, will be turned into hell. Now those are hard words. The Bible also says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, 
He'll hear that prayer. You turn from your sins. He'll forgive those sins. And he'll heal your land. Do we pray? Do we believe that God will change things? From what we've seen in science and in the Bible today, he's not just sitting by as a spectator. He will change things. He can and he does do miracles. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we finish up today, we're going to read on down briefly. It said, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You may remember that Abel brought of the first fruits of his flock, which required blood. Cain, however, brought of his produce, which did not require blood. And God simply approved of Abel's sacrifice. He did not approve of Cain's. Cain could have learned from that. He could have said, oh, well, now I know what God likes. So I'll start bringing from my own flocks sacrifices also. But instead, Cain became jealous of Hebel, of Abel. And he rose up and he killed his brother. And it says that as we went on down through verse 5, he says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. You remember Enoch? He was the guy in the book of Bereshit, the guy in the book of Genesis. He was the man who walked with God. Mm, interesting. Because it seems like, so far we've talked about Abraham, We've talked about Sarah. We've talked about Abel. And we've talked about Enoch. Abel offered the sacrifice. Abraham left everything that he knew and believed in God's promise and went like God said that he should go. Abel brought the sacrifice from his flocks. And Enoch had the testimony by Torah in the Torah that he was a man who walked with God. And yet, the book of Genesis in chapter 11 now is telling us that these were men of faith. So there's a clue there, isn't there? There's something there. There's a secret there that's revealed to us. That faith is not just believing, but it is an action verb. To have faith means that you do something. That your faith that you have in your heart as you believe in God requires you to act on that faith and do something. You say that you belong to Him. But sometimes I can't hear the words because I'm blinded by the actions that we see. You hear some people out on the street say, Oh, I believe in God. But they're living for Satan. You see, faith requires action. We are saved by grace, the gift of God. But every gift that is given requires that we reach out and receive it, does it not? There is an action on your part. And then when he plants that seed in you, what for? What's the reason? Mahasiba. What's the reason? Why did he do this? So that that seed will grow up into a plant. And it will produce fruit. And so if you allow the Lord to have his way in your life, then you will see your life being changed from day to day. And the things that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit will start showing in your life. But if you do not have patience, if you do not have love for your fellow man, if you do not have forgiveness, if you do not have long-suffering, if you are not merciful, then I must question your relationship with God because the faith that comes from God is the kind of faith that does something. You're not doing something to make yourself more righteous to God. You're just doing something because that's what God's seed in your life does. Don't suppress it. Don't hide it. Don't try to stop it. 
It's more than just a ticket out of hell and a ticket to let you into heaven. It is a way of life. It is a change. You're different now, you see. Let God have his way in your life and allow his faith to accomplish what he wants to. These were all men of action in the Torah, in the Tanakh. And everything that they did proved their faith. And just like the prophet James, or the apostle James said in the book of James, also in the New Testament, he says, you tell me you have faith and, and you're a believer because of that. He says, but you're telling me just words and I need to see something. I will show you my faith by what I do. It's not just words. Show me your faith, he says. Let the Lord see your faith. Let him see that fruit in your life. And as we get into this chapter today at our first part, and we close, just remember what verse 6 says. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay. We've said three things then that we must remember. First, that you must believe in the Word of God. You must believe that He made everything. You must believe that He is God and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. He's not far from any of us. He hears every thought. Oh, does that surprise you? He made the mind. He designed the thought process. He's the engineer. He's the creator. Why would he not understand the mind? Why would he not hear the thought? He sees the secret places. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to rely on him. And then he wants your life to let that faith be known and produce fruit. He wants it to produce work in your life that gives Him glory. Not the Mercedes for you, but it gives glory to Him. That's the first thing. Believe in Him. From the very first verse of the Bible, we're called to believe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What? No reason? No explanation of how he did it. Let me see the engineering analysis. I want to see the blueprint. I want to see the space-time continuum warp curve. I, I want to know exactly how God did it. He doesn't tell you. Because he calls you to a walk of faith. And then once you come to him in faith, for by grace you are saved through faith, then you are his child. And he gives his eternal life. He says, when you believe in the work that I did on the cross of Calvary, that God became a man, this man's name was Yeshua, and that he lived his life keeping the Torah at all times. Why? So that he would qualify to die for you and I. And then reaching that point, he allowed his life to be taken as a sacrifice. He laid it down himself. He said no man takes it from him. He laid it down himself because of his great love for you and I. And so even the New Testament also says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So Genesis called us to believe Numbers 11 says that the people were punished because they did not believe in all the wonderful works that God had done for them. Water from the rock, manna from heaven. He defeated the armies of Paro, king of Egypt, Pharaoh. He did all of this. And still they did not believe in his wonders. He said in Numbers 11, so he said, Therefore you will not enter my promised land, but your children will. So you see, belief was every bit as important to God in the Torah, in the Tanakh, as it is today in John 3.16, where he said that all who believes in God's only begotten Son will have everlasting life and not perish. 
God hasn't changed. He still expects faith. He still expects us to believe. What are you using to get to the kingdom of heaven? There's only one way. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is only one way. You may think that you have an agreement with the man upstairs, but if your agreement is not written in the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, it's worth nothing. What he did was so costly. It's the greatest love story the world has ever known. And it all starts with his gift, his grace, that is received through this wonderful thing called faith. And as we go through the next couple of weeks, we're going to continue studying this wonderful thing called faith and see the role that it's supposed to play in our lives today.